So I'm Glenn Cohen. Uh, I'm a professor here at the law school and one of the directors of the Petrie Flom Center. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you today. So the first most important thing I'll say throughout the whole conference is to make a major thank you uh, to Chrissy Hutchinson Jones, my administrative director, and Holly Lynch, my executive director, without whom this conference would not be possible. So please, a big round of applause before we start for the two of them. Now, the second most important thing you'll hear me say is that the bathrooms are directly behind us, right? There's a men's room and a woman's room right back there. That's important information, information you need to know, right? We have great speakers and the like, but the pull of the bladder is also very powerful, right, uh, beyond libertarian paternalism and the like. So uh, a few uh, uh, just prosaic announcements to begin with. First of all, the event will be live blogged at our blog, Bill of Health. It'll also be tweeted, and that's the... Twitter handle over there if you want to follow it on Twitter or add to the conversation. Uh, we will be recording uh, today's session, so just know that when you make comments. Uh, the, you have information in your folder about the Dropbox that has a copy of all the draft papers uh, being presented today. We've asked moderators to be relatively uh, brief, actually extremely brief, in their introductions because we have a biography sheet for all presenters in the folder as well. Uh, internet is free and freely available under Harvard Guest. If you need to log on or you have any problems, let me know. Um, we are very, very careful about time, and we are a little bit fascistic, perhaps, about time. And we use this with a machine-human interface. This is the machine over here. What it does is it gives you a green light when you're good, an orange light when you're getting to the end of it, and a red light when you're out of time. Then there is a blinking red light, and then we have a button where we get to buzz you beyond that. That is the machine part. The human part is all of you. We're going to ask the audience to participate in group shaming of people who go far beyond their time to keep us uh, on track. So I want to make sure you know you have not only license, but encouragement to be restless, rustle, you know, start typing or something like that. Whatever you want to do, but that's how we keep people on time here, and people know their time limits. So, you know, machine, human learning at the best. Um, we like to keep the questions quite short. We will take questions in tranches. There are microphones set up over there. After each, uh, at the end of each session, there'll be a question time, and we'll have people line up. Questions should be around 30 seconds or shorter. If you go on too long, the moderator will cut you off. Uh, and questions should be questions. Comments are OK, too, as long as they're short. Uh, but please keep it short. Um, I think those are all of the more prosaic announcements. So from prosaic, I now get to switch to the high-minded. Because what conference should not begin with a discussion of Immanuel Kant, right? So Kant, in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, offers us several formulations of the categorical imperative. One of them, sometimes referred to as the, uh, the formula of humanity, says, act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but at the same time as an end. He also offers a third, I think, much less uh, commonly discussed formulation uh, focused on autonomy and self-legislation. A rational being belongs to the kingdom of ends as a member when he legislates in its universal laws, while also being himself subject to these laws. He belongs to it as sovereign when, as a legislator, he is himself subject to the will of no other. A rational being must always regard himself as a legislature in a kingdom of ends rendered possible by freedom of the will, whether as a member or as a sovereign. So there's nothing at first glance that seems more respecting uh, of human beings and their nature and their ends than promoting health. On almost any moral theory, Rawlsian capabilities, even utilitarian, health is one of the most important goods, either in and of itself or as a gateway good to other kinds of valued things. But when our efforts of health promotion, when do they cross the line between treating individuals as ends in themselves and promoting those ends versus treating them as mere means? When do we intrude on the freedom of the will and render individuals subjects but not sovereigns in the kingdom of ends? Although I ask this question in a Kantian frame, it need not be phrased or framed that way. Libertarians might ask, at what point do choice architecture principles intrude on the basic liberties and end up being deception or manipulation? Rawlsians could ask when the attempts to promote, promote distributive justice in the healthcare sphere will bow to the lexical priority of liberty. 
Consequentialists might ask about preference laundering and when the kinds of preference interventions may foster, uh, stop, uh, cause preferences to stop being informed and authentic but instead be manipulated versus uh, enhancing the authenticity. These are in many ways the key questions of this conference. We've brought together scholars from law, economics, medicine, philosophy, public health, and many other disciplines to ask, in what ways can the science of behavioral economics be harnessed to improve the health choices of individuals? And at what point does doing so go too far, go from being a nudge to a shove? Well, our first keynote speaker today knows quite a bit uh, about nudges and these issues quite well. Uh, Cass Sunstein is currently the Robert Walmsley University Professor of Harvard. From 2009 to 2012, he was Administrator of OIRA at the White House. He is the Founder and Director of the Program in Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law School. He's testified before Congressional Committees on many subjects and has been involved in constitution making and law reform activities in a number of nations. He's the author of many articles and many books. I'll just name a few that happen to be particularly relevant. Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness with Richard Thaler. Simpler, The Future of Government. And most recently, Why Nudge, The Politics of Libertarian Paternalism. He is the most cited law professor on any US faculty, and he's also a very formidable squash player. But my favorite accolade uh, for Cass Sunstein actually comes from our friend Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck called him, quote, the most dangerous man in America, unquote. <laughs> I, you know, I have to frame this correctly, because earlier in the year, we had Peter Singer here, who is referred to as the most dangerous man in the world. So Cass Sunstein, I think, plays second fiddle to Peter Singer only in dangerousness, right? <laughs> But this appellation reminds me of something that Bentham once wrote. Bentham was responding to the allegation by Alexander Wenderbird. Uh, he was the Solicitor General, uh, Attorney General, and afterwards uh, he was a Chancellor of England, who said the happiness principle, the principle of utility, uh, was a dangerous principle. And Bentham writes in reply, dangerous to whom, my Lord Chancellor? To you, and he writes, I quote, to all those principles which lay down as the only right and justifiable end of government, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, how can it be denied to be, denied to be a dangerous one? Dangerous it unquestionably is to every government which has for its actual end or object the greatest happiness of a certain one, namely you, Mr. Lord Chancellor. So that's the kind of danger that I like, and that's the kind of danger that Cass Sunstein always brings to the table. So without further ado, let me introduce Cass Sunstein. Hey, uh, Glenn Beck actually described me not only as the most dangerous man in America, but also as the most evil. Uh, which I thought was a striking word because there are a lot of people in jail for terrible acts, so that was that was something. Um, uh, it is uh, really an honor uh, uh, to be here and to see people I've uh, read or I know, and uh, papers are completely amazing, so I'm really eager to hear you all. Uh, in terms of what I'm going to focus on, the the leading objection, at least in terms of uh, linking. Uh, governments and uh, academics and ordinary people to uses of behavioral economics for choice architecture. Uh, I think in its most um, appealing form emphasizes active choosing and its virtues. So this is a theme uh, traceable to John Stuart Mill. You can connect it to Kant, uh, where the idea is that default rules certainly uh, other kinds of nudges potentially are a problem uh, because of the fact that choice making is, is a muscle and we don't want to let it atrophy. Now that can be linked to various suspicions about choice architects, but that's the, the basic idea about the development of the muscle. Uh, I want to make in response to that sometimes convincing objection uh, three sets of arguments. Uh, the first is that sometimes people choose not to choose, and in circumstances in which people choose not to choose, uh, the preference for active choosing is either libertarian paternalism itself, and therefore part of the family, not an opposition, or actually a form of non-libertarian paternalism that runs right directly into the Millian train. 
So the most provocative way to put it is the preference for active choosing is actually a train wreck in the making in situations in which people choose not to choose. Uh, the second argument is, the, is based on, I think, the only really great idea that's come from the economic analysis of law. There are lots of very good ideas, but there's one great idea. And the great idea is that when you're stuck, it's, uh, it's useful to think about decision costs and error costs and how to minimize their sum. So my second suggestion is, in thinking about active choosing versus default rules or other alternatives, uh, we ought to be trying to minimize the sum of, of decision costs and error costs. That's our uh, little workaday framework. And the third claim is that applying that framework, sometimes it is best to choose not to choose, and sometimes the choice not to choose should be honored by choice architects, even if it's merely implicit, because it minimizes decision costs by taking away burdens from busy people, and because it reduces the magnitude and number of errors, because the busy people know, or would know on reflection, that if they were forced to choose, or even asked to choose, they might go in a direction that would not serve their interests. So those are the ideas. Uh, to, to orient them, uh, let's uh, get on the ground and think about some examples. Uh, suppose a private company, a large one, let's, let's stipulate, is deciding among three options. To enroll people automatically in a health insurance plan, as the Affordable Care Act requires large employers to do by 2015. To make them opt in if they like with an opt out default, with a non-enrollment default or to say as a condition for starting work, they have to indicate whether they want health insurance, and if so, which plan they want. So it's an opt-out design, an opt-in design, or active choosing. Suppose case two, a utility company is deciding whether to adopt for consumers a green default, which is environmentally friendly, but somewhat more expensive, or instead a gray default, which is cheaper but environmentally more harmful. Or instead, option three, to ask consumers which energy source they prefer, and to say you can't get electricity here unless you indicate your desire. A uh, third example, suppose a doctor is dealing with a patient who's facing a difficult medical circumstance. Uh, the doctor could treat the patient as an active chooser, putting a set, an array of options in front of him or her with a full set of statistical analyses or something approximating that and say, you choose. Or the doctor could urge something like a default saying either, if it were me, I would, or most patients do, or the statistics suggest you should. And in each of those cases, asking for the patient to um, to opt out if he or she wishes. Okay, in all of these cases and countless others, many bearing on the Affordable Care Act, an institution's deciding whether to use a default rule or instead to require some kind of active choice. I'm going to spend some time on trying to figure out what require means in that sentence. It's kind of ambiguous. It doesn't mean that the structure of their body is going to explode if they don't meet an active choice. So what, what does that mean exactly? For those who reject paternalism and like freedom of choice, active choosing obviously has uh, a lot of appeal. If one thinks that and rejects anything in the nature of a default rule or a nudge, one might emphasize that public officials and other choice architects, certainly doctors and hospitals and health insurers, are prone to error as well. And so if we emphasize behavioral biases, we might strengthen rather than weaken the objection to paternalism. If you emphasize Hayek's problem, that is the knowledge problem, you might think that the problem of behavioral bias on the part of government is compounded, and it gets worse still if you emphasize the public choice problem, that is behavioral biases that might be um, compounded by the fact that interest groups are pushing people around. And there are private sector alternatives where the choice architects might be ignorant of the diversity of situations or might be uh, pressing their own interests. On grounds of both welfare and autonomy, active choosing might seem desirable even if people sometimes have a tendency to, to err. 
So we have, on the basis of that constellation of thoughts, which I think Ed Glazer, Harvard's own, has put most uh, compactly and powerfully, some suggestions that if we understand behavioral economics, we will be especially skeptical, skeptical of anything resembling paternalism and want active choosing. So this is the opposition. What I want to do is to unsettle the opposition and suggest that it's illusory. Because some people, many people, want not to choose. They may do that because they find the underlying questions difficult, painful, and troublesome, empirically, morally, or otherwise. They might have limited bandwidth and be under circumstances of stress. They might not want to take responsibility for bad outcomes for themselves. They might be alert to their own lack of information and their own biases and think for that reason that they want a delegate. When people prefer not to choose, many private and public institutions are nonetheless requiring them to choose, either through libertarian paternalism or through something stronger. To that extent, active choosing is itself paternalistic, yes? Men, nanny states forbid choosing, but they also forbid the choice not to choose. It's a form of nannyism. Choice requiring paternalism might be an attractive form of paternalism, but it's no oxymoron, and it's paternalistic nonetheless. OK, those who favor active choosing are often mandating it and therefore overriding on paternalistic grounds people's no choice not to choose. In a way, they're completely tracking the paternalist arguments, paternalistic arguments of those who favor soft or hard paternalism. It's kind of tacit, a distrust of people's own choices. When people prefer not to choose, required choosing is a form of coercion, though it might be the right form. Okay, we have to make a distinction be here between cases where people are forced to choose and people are asked whether they want to make a choice but allowed to opt out in favor of something else. So we can imagine a situation of what we might call simplified active choosing, where people are told the default is an active choice, but, uh, but if you want to opt out of that default and default to a default rule, you can. That's simplified active choosing. There's a lot to be said for simplified active choosing in many contexts, and I think we're going to see it in a lot of situations in the future. But it's important to acknowledge that whenever a private or public institution asks people to choose, even in the simplified form, it might be overriding their preference not to do that. And that point applies even when people are being asked whether they want to choose to, cho to, choose, to choose. I added one extra to choose there. I just meant to have two. People ask, do you want to choose to choose? Do you choose to choose? That is respectful of their choice-making power, yes. But if they have a, a, a desire not to choose, they don't want to think about it. Then we are overriding that second-order choice. And that's a form of paternalism. If you think about purchases of a cell phone or purchases of a computer or interactions with your doctor or your health insurer, I think that point can get on the ground very quickly, where a series of choice-making questions can get profoundly irritating because it's overriding your choice not to choose in those circumstances. And if it's being done, it's paternalistic, softly paternalistic if you're allowed to say, just default me there to something else, what you think is best. But it's paternalistic nonetheless because it's requiring the person to make that statement, which they'd prefer not to do. OK. There's a lot of heterogeneity in this domain across persons and across contexts. Some people in some areas that bear on health care would be willing to pay a premium to have the power to choose themselves. That's what they want. Other people in other contexts would be willing to pay a premium to have someone else choose them, for, choose for them. And people have an intuitive appreciation of this fact in other contexts whether you want a menu approach to social life with a bunch of items from which you can select, or whether you want a default menu to which you can defer. We need to know a lot more about people's actual preferences in the context of healthcare. And the upshot I'm, I'm going to suggest is that active choosing is overrated as a way of tracking people's actual preferences or their preferences if they were informed. 
So the, the suggestion is that the intuitively appealing and noble Millian theme about exercising the choice-making muscle runs into trouble in a lot of domains in which people exercise that choice-making muscle by choosing not to choose. Okay. Uh, I promised that I would say something about what requiring active choosing means. And this turns out to be a more complicated question than it appears at first glance, and I confess I'm still struggling with it. And it seems to have three faces. The first is a criminal or civil punishment for people who refuse to make an active choice. Now, in a free society, that's a jarring idea, isn't it? To say that you're going to pay a fine or go to jail or something if you refuse to make a choice. It's rare. But in some nations, including Australia and Belgium, you're subject to civil sanctions if you fail to vote and, in that sense, fail to make a choice. And the Affordable Care Act famously requires people to make a choice about health insurance, at least to enroll, subject to punishment of a kind if they fail to do so. OK, so it's not unheard of to do this, um, but it's very rare. We don't see it a whole lot. The second kind of face of requiring active choosing is hard to capture in a simple formulation, so bear with me for a moment. The idea seems to be active choosing is going to be required with respect to a related or ancillary matter as a condition for obtaining a good or a service. I wish I had a simpler frame for it. I think this is where a lot of the action is. The idea is that active choosing is required in the sense that unless people make an active choice on some ma ma matter, they can't get a good or service even though that good or service, narrowly defined, is not the specific topic of the choice they are being asked to make. So one example is, look, you can't work for this employer unless you indicate your preferences with respect to retirement. No choice with retirement plan? You can't work here. Another one is, you have to choose a health plan or you can't work here. You can't enroll as a student at Harvard unless you make choices with respect to X, Y, and Z. Where the thing in question has a relationship to the active choice that's being required, but it's not identical to it. Another example is to say that unless you indicate your preferences for organ donation, you can't get a driver's license. And we could imagine quite tight connections between the required active choice and the good and service that you're getting. Like you can't buy a computer unless you indicate whether you want some sort of insurance policy for it. So there's a pretty tight connection. Or you could imagine one that's really ancillary, which would say, for example, you can't get a driver's license unless you've indicated your preferences with respect to your retirement plan. There you're leveraging one thing into another. Okay, in this second category, the kind of coercion in my first, the criminal civil fine, is not in terms present. But there's a lot of coercion there if the good or service is one that people really need in order to function. So it may be um, in terms of the lived experience of the chooser identical. Okay, the third category is, I think, familiar in a free market economy but actually less inevitable than appears, and maybe will seem less inevitable 30 years from now from how it seems now. The idea here is that active choosing means people have to make a decision about goods or services or jobs as a condition for obtaining a good or service or job. So there's no leveraging as in the second case. There's no punishment as in the first case. It's just saying with respect to consumption decisions, people are given a range of options, and they don't get them unless they make an active choice. If you go to a website, a restaurant, or a grocery or appliance store, you're asked to make that choice, and the default is you don't get anything. So in that sense, active choosing is required. OK, what I want to suggest is there's nothing inevitable about that situation. And if we put a little pressure on it, I think we'll get some purchase on some of the problems that the healthcare domain is now presenting. We could imagine a situation, couldn't we, in which a seller assumes or presumes 
that people want certain products and which, in which they get them and have to pay for them unless they opt out. So a bookseller, and this is less science fictional every day, might know that you like books by Stephen King or Joyce Carol Oates or Amartya Sen, and the likelihood that you're going to get them once they are published is very close to 100%. And the bookseller could just presume or could ask you to enroll in a program in which it's going to be entitled to presume that you want them. And then it'll send them to you and you can send them back. Okay, we don't see that very often, and Amazon has been talking a little bit about it of late, and people are stirred up, they don't like it very much. It's interesting to think why this is disturbing. There's a good argument that the strongest reason to require active choosing is that reliable, predictive algorithms don't yet exist, and hence active choosing is an indispensable safeguard against erroneous purchases that is, ones that aren't in the interests of those denominated purchasers. That's just an argument about knowledge. It's an epistemic argument. It speaks in terms of Bentham rather than Kant. And uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, a new collection of his writings, just appeared. It's a very striking sentence where he argues that the planner just doesn't know things about the people for whom the planner is planning. And that is the chief argument for liberty. It's a remarkable suggestion that the chief argument for liberty is epistemic, the choice architect's lack of knowledge. And if, if Hayek is right on that, then the third face of active choosing is going to be under pressure to the extent that the institution actually fills its epistemic gap. Okay, that's an effort to clear some ground to figure out what we mean by uh, active choosing and requiring it. Okay. Is active choosing paternalistic when people would prefer not to choose? Yeah, we have to get some handle on what paternalism is to get into that question. Let's suggest very mundanely that a private or public institution is acting paternalistically when it doesn't believe that people's choices will promote their welfare, and it's taking steps to influence or alter people's choices for their own good. That's our kind of homely definition of paternalism. If we're nervous about paternalism, we'll probably have one or two accounts in the background. One might involve welfare, and the other might involve autonomy. So Mill's principal argument was based on welfare, where the idea was the individual is the person most interested in his own well-being, and the ordinary man, uh, now sounding, Mill sounding like Hayek, the ordinary man or woman has means of knowledge immeasurably, immeasurably surpassing those can, that can be possessed by anyone else. When society seeks to overrule the individual's judgment, it does so on the basis of general presumptions, which may be altogether wrong, and even if right, are as likely as not to be misapplied to individual cases. That's a claim about error costs and their relationship to welfare. We might also think, in terms of autonomy or dignity, and think welfare to one side, it's uh, objectionable to override people's judgments, especially in sensitive areas, but not only, about what's in their best interests, even if they're wrong. OK, let's ask whether the welfare and autonomy objections apply to the choice not to choose. At first glance, they apply straightforwardly, don't they? If people make a choice not to choose, they are in the best position to know, Mill's point, about what's in their own interests. And their choice not to choose, whether the issue involves health insurance or retirement plans or uh, the proper course of treatment in the case of uh, cancer, their choice not to cho choose on Millian strictures is as, respect as to be respected as anyone else. They might find it a relief or possibly in some cases fun, to delegate. They might not want to pay the choosers the psychic costs associated with regretting their choice. Active choosing saddles the chooser with responsibility that by hypothesis is unwelcome and reduces their welfare for that reason. So along the dimension of decision costs and error costs, the chooser is judging that a delegation makes sense. 
We might think also that if autonomy is our goal or dignity, that that deserves, um, that applies fully to a case of choosing not to choose. People have decided not to exercise their autonomy by exercising their autonomy to delegate. And it's an insult, a form of disrespect, to override that decision. We could imagine hard cases in which a choice not to choose seems to be an alienation of freedom. We could think of cases that involve intimate decisions. Slavery, of course, is the extreme case. But we could involve others where the delegation seems to be a form of self-alienation. But that's not going to apply very often. We can also imagine cases in which the choice not to choose is not in the chooser's interest as the chooser would define it. So choice requiring paternalism might have a welfareist justification, just in the same way the choice denying paternalism might have a welfareist justification. Maybe the chooser chooses not to choose only because he lacks important information or suffers from myopia or present bias. Those who reject paternalism will see these concerns as a justification for providing more and better information, not for blocking choices. And I think in these consideration, these kind of behavioral objections to honoring the choice not to choose, we're just rerunning the behavioral objections to overriding other kinds of choices. There's no difference. So that's the basis for the suggestion that the preference for active choosing is across a certain territory to be analyzed exactly the same way as interferences with other forms of choice making. OK, given all that, suggesting that we're talking about the family of libertarian paternalism and paternalism, not a different universe in the preference for active choice choosing, we have to figure out what is the case for active choosing. And what I'm going to do in the remainder of the remarks is kind of march up a hill, trying to put active choosing in the best possible light, and then march down, suggesting that the considerations that march up the hill are relevant and part of the decision cost error cost framework, but not decisive. So the hill marching is going to suggest more enthusiasm for active choice choosing than I ultimately have. But I want to get them all, all of the considerations on the table. And sometimes they are decisive. OK, the first point involves learning. And here the idea is that uh, libertarian paternalists have an analogy, or maybe stronger than that, that actually is easily turned against them. And that's the GPS. So the idea is that a GPS is a prime behavioral tool in the sense that it helps people to get in the direction they want to go, but enables them to go their own route if they see fit. So we can see a GPS as a form of soft, means-oriented paternalism which is the least contentious kind. There's a study of cab drivers in London from a few years ago. It didn't involve GPSs. And it found that there's actually a neural change in London cab drivers as they get to understand their route. As they get their route, their brains develop a certain way. If they had GPSs, that wouldn't happen. And this, the problem is that there's a muscular power, and this is a quote from Mill, that is improved only by being used. And here the argument is that the case for active choosing is it develops a kind of capital stock in people, which is really important for other aspects of their lives and their future selves. Choosers might select active choosing and reject defaults for exactly this reason. They might want to develop their own faculties. For their part, choice architects might know that a certain outcome is in the interests of most people, but they might also believe that it's independently important for people to learn about the underlying questions so that they can use that stock in the future. In the context of health decisions, we can see this, can't we? Where a health insurer or a doctor might think the chooser wants not to choose, but that's a bit of a problem because they won't develop a faculty which can help them elsewhere. 
I don't mean to suggest any particular judgment about these examples, just to suggest that there's a justification for active choosing, which the decision cost error, frame, cost, or error cost framework has to struggle a bit to capture, and that involves learning. Okay, I'm going to make some more arguments in favor of active choosing. This is, I think, the most um, abstractly appealing, but we have to give an extended footnote and wonder whether the footnote is a really decisive objection. Here's the footnote. People do and should learn about whether to choose actively or instead to choose not to choose. This is a response to the Millian argument for muscle development and learning of the nature, anything you can do, I can do meta, as some law professors like to say. That is, the muscle uh, that is exercised in choice making is exercised also in deciding whether to choose actively or instead to choose not to choose. So if you're with me, people learn in life whether it's good to choose or not by exercising that particular muscle, the choice whether to choose. And they find, don't they, we find, don't we, that in many contexts, choosing, is not worth it, it's annoying, it's time consuming, it produces mistakes, ask the expert or use the default rule. Or we find that choosing not to choose was a mistake, we got in a lot of trouble and we didn't learn. This is only to suggest it's important for people to learn over time about when they should be choosing and when they should be relying on a default rule. That form of second order learning is really important this is an objection to the learning case for active choosing. The problem is that those who insist on active choosing, or even favor it, are reducing or preventing learning along this very important dimension, the choice-making dimension. Claiming to promote learning and the development of values and preference, they truncate such learning and such development about this extremely important set of questions. Okay, this suggests not that the argument from learning dissipates, but it has to be more refined. It has to be that in particular cases, it's really important that people engage in first order rather than second order learning because the subject is one for which they should accumulate some kind of capital, either about facts or about what they really like or about what they really value. And it's a nice question in what context in healthcare that argument is convincing. So I fear I've gotten kind of abstract so to summarize, the, there's an argument for learning, which calls for active choosing, even if people would choose not to choose. There's an objection to that argument, which says when they choose not to choose or not, they can learn from that too. And why are we preventing that form of learning? And then the more refined argument says, in particular cases, it's the first order learning, the building of the capital stock that really matters. Okay, two uh, less abstract arguments for active choosing. <laughs> The second, the first involves learning, has to do with error-prone or ill-motivated choice architects. And here the idea is that a private or public institution is bound to lack some information, and its chosen rule might be harmful to some or many choosers. One problem is just the individual situation doesn't match what the chooser know, what the choice architect knows about most situations, Mill's point, the other is that the active chooser might benefit from not being subject to the potentially selfish motivations of the choice architect. So we could imagine contexts in which a health provider or a bank or an insurance company or a doctor has some sort of personal motivation which would lead to errors if the person isn't asked to choose. So if we put our focus on the choice architect, not on the chooser, we'll have some arguments for active choosing. The third point involves heterogeneity. And here the argument is that active choosing appropriately handles it. So if you return to the cases with which I began, energy, health insurance, doctor decisions, active choosing can have big advantages when the relevant group is heterogeneous so that a single approach won't fit their circumstances. I just remembered, by the way, a, a little story I will tell you. 
and I, I bet have, has resonance for, for you all. I had about four years ago a completely non-threatening medical thing where the doctors did lots and lots of tests. No, no bad consequences at all. Nothing, nothing was wrong. But the, the new number of tests is really high. And when I got to the last test, the doctor said, you know, I'm convinced you have no problem, but a lot of patients would like further tests. And if you can't sleep at night, I'll give you the further tests. And, and he expected, I would say, please, more tests. And that, to me, was like the most obvious question, no more tests. And the, the, the point is that he was alert to the existence of heterogeneity with respect to people's uh, reactions to a very, very low probability of harm, knowing that some people want that and some people don't. And he went active choice. It was an interesting decision on his part, because you could imagine a doctor who would have gone default either way. And that's just to suggest that in the face of heterogeneity, there's good arguments for active choosing because people's values and situations are different. Now, I think we have to be careful about this because the argument against one-size-fits-all situations threatens itself to be a one-size-fits-all argument. And there are contexts in which one size really does fit all, or at least fits a not close to all. But in many situations where a default rule is tempting, the problem of heterogeneity is a very strong argument for active choosing. And this can be an argument both to the chooser saying, please choose actively, or to the choice architect saying, you want to favor active choosing because that's what is in the interests of most of your population. OK, we're done marching up the hill. Now we're going to march down. OK, I want to get at this through uh, an argument in, in a very different context made by, in oral remarks by MIT economist Esther DeFlo, who is speaking about poverty. She's not really speaking about choice making as such. What she says is, this is oral remarks, not from her terrific book, Poor Economics, where the same argument appears. She says, we tend to be patronizing about the poor in a very specific sense, which is that we tend to think, why don't they take more responsibility for their lives? And what we are forgetting is that the richer you are, the less responsibility you need to take for your own life, because everything is taken care for you. And the poorer you are, the more you have to be responsible for everything about your life. Stop berating people for not being responsible and start to think of ways instead of providing the poor with the luxury that we all have, which is that a lot of decisions are taken for us. If we do nothing, we are on the right track. For the most of, most of the poor, if they do nothing, they are on the wrong track. Okay, what she's urging is that for people in societies that well, are well-functioning or whose lives are going well, Choice making is not necessary for a wide range of indispensable things. There are choices taken for us, and such steps not only increase our welfare, but also promote our autonomy, because we're freed up to spend our time on other matters. We don't have to decide how to make railroads and airplanes safe. We don't need to figure out a lot what to do in the case of a, of a, a medical issue. We don't need to struggle terribly hard to make sure that the air is safe to breathe and the water is safe to, to drink. It's important that we can participate in processes that lead to these things. But active choosing just isn't a, um, a, a pervasive feature of the human condition in the sense that in well-functioning societies, there are defaults everywhere. And this is an objection, I think, to active choosing that has uh, two uh, two features. The first is that active choosing could impose really large burdens on choosers. And thank goodness that in many domains, we don't have to worry about those burdens. If the situation is unfamiliar and complicated, and if we lack information and experience, we might think that active choosing would be frustrating and require a pointless red tape. Doctors' offices and insurance forms typically take this, have this defect, yes? Where the range of active choices you have to make is simply too large. Few consumers would, have, would like to spend the time required to, make, to obtain relevant information and decide what choice to make 
about a wide range of things that actually affect ourselves. This is just a point about how active choosing increases the cost of decisions sometimes significantly. The last point is that active choosing can increase errors. This is a point against the great mill. So the big objection to Mill is that his ep epistemic foundation for the harm principle actually runs into a lot of trouble in a lot of contexts where the individual lacks the expertise and experience to make the judgment that's best for him or her. And the active, and the active chooser knows that frequently. If the area is really technical and confusing, Active choosing can lead people to make blunders, and they know that. It might be best for choice architects to rely on their own technical expertise. It might be better to rely on experiments or pilot studies that elicit choices from informed people and then use those choices to build defaults. So there's an interesting debate in the context of retirement planning whether the best thing to do is to let the experts kind of figure it out what's best for people. We can describe that as the Pandora model, if you know the website Pandora, where if you like Britney Spears, then Pandora knows what other songs you'll like, not because it knows what people like you choose, but because Pandora knows what sounds like Britney Spears. That's an expert model. Or the alternative view, don't rely on the experts, do pilot studies in which you figure out what informed people choose and then build up defaults on the basis of what informed people like you choose. And that's more like the Amazon or Netflix model, which is finding out what people like you like rather than the Pandora model, which is the technical expert model. So two different ways of developing defaults. They both have their virtues and the argument for the Netflix or Amazon model is strengthened if we think the technical people are going to miss stuff and the informed choosers will be more accurate. So the building up out of the pilot study promises to reduce decision costs down the line because you default people, but to reduce error costs because the informed people are uh, driving the judgments that underlie the defaults. The Pandora model looks better if we think that the technocrats just have more specialized competence than the informed people, so relying on the pilot studies is a waste of time. OK, so now we have a simple framework to explain when it makes sense to choose and when it makes sense to choose not to do that. And that framework, I'm hoping, is going to clarify the decisions of choice architects, too. If the area is confusing and unfamiliar, default rules or other nudges are desirable because they reduce both decision costs and error costs. If we have biased or ignorant choice architects, they're not going to be devising good defaults or nudges, and so active choosing is best. If there's heterogeneity within the population of choosers, active choosing has real advantages because, again, it diminishes errors. If learning and development of tastes and preferences is really important, that's a good argument for active choosing, a general theme that has run throughout these remarks and that argues against choosing not to choose. A promising approach is often to ask people to make an active choice, but to inform them that they can rely on a default rule if they like. That simplified active choosing, I think we're going to see it a lot. Its advantage is that it minimizes decision costs and error costs and it can be seen to protect people's autonomy as well, as a default rule standing itself might not. This doesn't mean that active choosing with a default rule alternative, what I'm calling simplified active choosing, is the best approach in all contexts. We've seen that it would be irritating and a bother and unnecessary in many. Sometimes a simple default rule is better, but there's a place for it. OK, what I've suggested is that in cases that involve learning or untrustworthy choice architects, choice requiring paternalism uh, has a good argument. It helps to operate in the interest of the free development of individuality, Mill's point. In some settings, people should be 
encouraged, maybe even required, to learn and to develop a capital stock, the muscle. In those cases, an insistence on active choosing can be seen as a way of promoting what may be seen, taken as a form of self-expansion. But my more general point, and the kind of bold letter theme, it's often best to honor and not to disparage people's choice not to choose. Thanks. So we'll now take questions. People shall line up uh, behind the microphone. Normally, we'll take questions in transit in two or three, because we'll have a panel. But because Cass is the only target at the moment, we'll let him. We'll take the questions one by one. Good morning. That was really interesting. I, I wanted to say your name before you speak, so we can have it for the record. Uh, Matthew Lawrence, a fellow here at the center. Um, I was curious what sort of choice you're kind of modeling the choice not to choose as being. Are you thinking of it as kind of a system two uh, calculated choice or system one kind of intuitive choice or maybe even I think of it kind of like system zero when I forget to turn the heat on, it's really like, or turn the heat off, it's kind of like a mental agenda setting. I don't even really choose, I just kind of flow by. Um, and when I hear Mill, it sounds like he wants people making system two choices and training that kind of reflection ability. And I just wonder whether kind of a, a counter argument to your learning counter argument is that um, when we do active choosing, we're forcing people from a system zero or a system one uh, non-choice or intuitive choice not to two into, you know, practicing the system two thinking. Yeah, that's great. So thank you for that. What I was thinking in the remarks is that the choice not to choose is a system two kind of a thing. And so I think the whole analysis works best if we see it as system two. And you have a good, I think, objection from your question, which is if the choice not to choose is a system one thing that reflects, let's say, present bias or unrealistic optimism or something, then we have a concern with the choice not to choose just as a concern with choosing. And there's some data on this. Chris C. has done it on people's choosing not to choose and whether it goes into error or not. I, I think, as I recall, the upshot of his paper is that people uh, uh, choose to choose a bit too often, and they uh, disregard, at least in some contexts, the value of not choosing, uh, in which case the system one, system two framework would go strongly in favor of honoring the choice not to choose. So, But I think you're quite right that the analysis needs to distinguish between um, automatic heuristic-driven choices not to choose and more deliberative choices not to choose. And if you have the first, then there's a series of objections. Hi, I'm Bob Trug from, from the Center for Bioethics at the Medical School, and I'd like to ask you a question from my experience as an anesthesiologist. Uh, suppose I'm seeing uh, someone with very severe heart or lung disease uh, and getting their consent for anesthesia, and I say, we really need to talk about y your risks here because they're significant. And the patient says to me, no, no, my surgeon and I have already talked about this. I know I definitely want the surgery, and I don't want to hear about the risks of anesthesia. Now, in that situation, since I'm the one who is going to be conveying those risks and perhaps harming the patient, do I have a right to say, I refuse to do the anesthesia unless you are willing to hear about the risks? In other words, are there times where the conveyor of a good or a service has a right to refuse to provide that unless the person agrees to be an active chooser and not go to a default? It's a great question. And since you know, the area is one I am far from an expert in, I'll, uh, I want to preface this by saying what I'm about to say is tentative and very possibly wrong. But, uh, but nonetheless, I believe it. Th there's a risk that to force that conversation on that patient if you can trust the patient accurately to have stated what happened with the earlier doctor, is a form of cruelty. So uh, a, a doctor, in, in, so far as there's no legal or ethical constraint, can do whatever he or she wants. But uh, I wonder whether it isn't best in that conversation to say to the patient, I got it. Uh, we're going to go ahead. 
Okay, I'll refrain from responding with the long line here. Thank you. I guess. Uh, Richard Williams, Mercatus Center, George Mason University. Um, it seems like you were commingling two types of choice architecture. The first, Pandora, which is based on a cooperative framework between Pandora and their customers. So whatever choice architecture they choose has to be based on cooperation. That's the market model. The other is government, which is more the coercion model. And I wonder if you want to distinguish between those two. Okay, so I, I didn't mean here to distinguish between private and public institutions. The, the uh, government, you might have special, as Mill did not, you might have special strictures about paternalism from government. I think that's completely fair. Um, there's a market discipline which constrains some forms of harmful choice architecture, and government's not subject to that. But I, but I wouldn't get all religious about that distinction. And what I think is missed by some people who make that kind of distinction is that choice architecture and nudging from government is inevitable. You cannot not have it. So the world, this is, Glazer has a terrific article which works along a certain domain, meaning optional nudging. You, if, you, if you think that government is whatever, the Buchanan problem is the public choice problem, the Hayek problem is the knowledge problem. I think the Hayek problem is underrated for government officials, the Buchanan problem is overrated for government officials, my own view. Uh, but you can't have government not nudging. So if the government has a website, if it has an office, if it communicates with its people, uh, it's going to be nudging. If it has a, 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 an office, if it has forms with orders on them, it's going to be nudging. Without the Affordable Care Act, there's a ton of nudging. So the, the question is, what's the best form of choice architecture? And uh, you might think that where there's optionality on the part of government nudging, you shouldn't do it. I, d I do think that that's uh, a religion and not the right religion, but uh, a lot of my best friends are true believers. I'm gonna take the moderator's privilege and ask uh, a question myself which has to do with spheres of nudging, let's say, and separate spheres arguments. So one way of thinking about this is that the answer about whether a nudge is appropriate or not can be reconciled to a set of variables, you know, decision costs, anxiety, transaction, you know, the, the usual kind of panoply, and that basically it's one can't say something like healthcare, this answer, here, that answer. Instead, one has to go to the variables. A different answer would be to say, though, that actually these domains, I think perhaps Professor Trug's question was trying to gesture at this, that these domains of life have a certain kind of professional self-organization or a kind of logic to them uh, or a moral matter that, that, that defines them in a way that it may make sense in one sphere but not another for reasons orthogonal to those kinds of variables. And I was kind of curious what your take on this is. It, it, it might be true, but I'd be surprised. So w w what I would guess is that the professional domain and the self-organization kind of falls out of a thought through or intuitive count of the more general framework. So if in medicine the doctors think uh, patient autonomy is our goal, that might be because they're scared of malpractice actions. Uh, better, it would be because that's a judgment about error costs and decision costs. Or, or it might have a kind of Kantian overlay without the utilitarian stuff in it. And for lawyers or you know, building architects or voting, you have the same stuff. So we don't have default voting. They don't say, you know, I mean, the most invidious form of default voting would be you vote for the incumbent unless you show up and say otherwise. That would be inconsistent with the eternal morality voting. One that's less invidious but interestingly uh, unacceptable is that people be defaulted into voting for the candidates of the political party for whom they voted last time. On a decision cost, error cost framework, it's not self-evident that's wrong, but it's inconsistent with the morality of voting. So this suggests there, there might be some areas where you have to work to figure out what the decision cost, error cost framework is about, or it may be incomplete in its standard form. But I think all of the professional stuff is parasitic on a more abstract framework. Uh, Jed Schwartz, a uh, writer. If I understand you correctly, I, I think I uh, disagree with you, uh, especially about the, uh, the Hayek choice, about the planner either 
knows everything or, or knows nothing. I, I, that was my understanding of your characterization of the, the Hayek choice. And, and that seems to be a false choice because only, only God knows everything and all of the planners know more or less. Uh, but uh, the, more, more specifically, the reason why I disagree with you is, is or I think I disagree with you is, is, is because if you take a, a sort of a gatekeeper or a planner who's, say, for example, uh, administering uh, the Affordable Care Act or involved in administering the Affordable Care Act or, or uh, an admissions officer or admissions planner at, at a college, uh, generally you would assume that all the, 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 the planner is trying to uh, 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 make more efficient the, the administration of the available funds in, 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 the, in, the, medical, in the medical plan and you would assume that the, the admissions officer is trying to, to get a better, a, a better class, always a better class, not, not, not I mean, he would have, you know, I mean, he, he would have a different uh, role than a fundraiser who would say, you know, we, we have the, you see what I mean. Uh, so, so that I'm making the case that what's needed in, in both cases is more definition of the, uh, of the, of the clients or the applicants more, more either self-definition and, and that either either self-definition that and that involves the, the pursuit of more knowledge about the the potential recipients of whatever the service is, whether okay, that comes. Get that to that you get, you get yeah. the point. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I don't see a disagreement between us yet. So you're completely right that uh, that it's not like the planner has complete information or no information. And Hayek didn't urge the planner had no information. Hayek's specific claim was the market encodes a ton more information than the planners can ever get. So socialist planning is going to fail, even if you have expert and well-motivated planners. And so that's completely consistent with your point. On the, the college admissions one, I'm a little stuck on because I, I take your point completely that what the college admissions officer is trying to do is to pr pr get the better class and now I have to define what that is. But that's, that's not the situation I'm talking about in the sense that it's not, it's not about interfering with people's choices or their choices not to choose for their own good. So the question that would be more parallel taking the good point about the difference between a private or public institution is suppose you have a, a hospital administrator who thinks that the patient's own choices along a certain domain aren't in the patient's interests. Then what do you do? Or suppose you think that the patient's choice not to choose, but to say, you choose for me, is not good. Then, then what do you do? And what I'm making a plea for really is uh, First, a framework for figuring out how to deal with that, and second, for general respect, so this is libertarian paternalism, general respect for people's choices, including their choice not to choose. Hi, thank you, I'm Margot Pollins from UCLA Law. Uh, so my question is about the, the difference in practice between active choosing and simplified active choosing. I so wonder if you could talk more about how that would work. So my concern is that a lot of people in a lot of situations would actually just treat the default option as one of the choices and would still need to understand how all of the choices work and compare them to the default before deciding if they want to choose or not. Okay, great. You may well be right. So uh, suppose uh, people are told um, you have seven possible insurance plans in your state, and you have to choose which one you like. Or suppose they're told uh, there are seven you can choose from, but people in your demographic generally choose plan C. Or plan C, we believe, is best suited to people in your demographic. And the beauty of that is, that if there is beauty, is that people can say, I don't know, the seven plans? I can't figure it out. And if most people do it, or if the, the experts think, then I can do that. So, so the difference is that you needn't assemble the information that would force you to figure it out. You can just say, I'll do the default. Now, if you're a real choice file, you won't like simplified active choosing because people won't be developing that muscle. And you might distrust the plan C. So th but that, that would be the difference. Won't ask a yeah. Yeah. I'm Peggy Wiesenberg. I'm a lawyer with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. 
Um, I am wondering, uh, since a lot of this is sort of based on rational choice making, and Kenneth Arrow and everybody believes like the world is very rational, and choice is about trying to deal with uncertainties and the irrational sometimes. I'm wondering um, if there's possibly another argument for the right not to choose. Um, and was wondering if you could talk about perhaps the uh, recent news that a poor woman in Mississippi um, did not presumably take advantage of all the nudges to get prenatal care. She was HIV positive, delivered a baby, and the doctor, I don't know, the papers didn't report on any dialogue between the patient and the doctor, but the doctor had to make some quick decisions and administered massive antiretroviral drugs and perhaps made a discovery for the world um, that is beneficial to the greater good. So I'm just wondering how you fit something like that. You know, the, because in science, a lot of um, advances are made through mistakes. Not error mistakes, but mistakes. Okay, I don't, don't know anything about the particular case, so I wouldn't want to comment on it, but uh, um, I am with a, a family of people, uh, many are in this room, who think that the rational choice model is inadequate. And uh, uh, people who think that don't talk about irrationality very much. They talk about bounded rationality. And that's the underlying substratum of, 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 of the remarks, that the reason for libertarian paternalism is not only that choice architecture of one or another sort is inevitable, but also that people suffer from uh, various uh, cognitive imperfections. And the reason for libertarian is, as stated, that uh, choice architects can err and people can learn and there's a lot of heterogeneity. So, so the framework is not a rational choice framework. Hi, um, I'm Moti Gorin. I'm a postdoc um, in medical ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. So what you were just saying is very relevant to my question. And um, when I return to the very first question that was asked, um, so in the first question that was asked was whether you see simplified active choice as a system one or sort of system two phenomenon. And I think I understood you as saying that if it turns out to be a system one sort of situation, a phenomenon, um, then there's a range of objections that one might bring. Um, but I want to ask about what if it's a system two phenomenon and how that then fits in with the more general story of what libertarian paternalism is supposed, is supposed to be. Um, the sort of interesting innovation of the libertarian paternalist program as I see it is that you know, we've learned from the social, science, uh, social scientists and cognitive psychologists that we aren't perfectly rational beings. We're subject to these uh, rational bias these biases and so forth. Let's see if policymakers can exploit these imperfections in our rationality to get people to decide in ways that end up benefiting them, right? Um, but to what extent does the simplified active choice actually um, fit within that paradigm? I mean, I, I, when I hear you describing, it seems to me this is an alternative to libertarian paternalism, right? Because we aren't actually trying to. Um, get people to make a particular su substantive choice. We're just saying, here, either choose, uh, you can choose not to choose, or you can go with our defaults. But it doesn't steer people in particular directions towards substantive choices, which is what libertarian paternalism is, is known for. So it's true that simplified active choice is libertarian. It might even be paternalistic, but doesn't seem to be libertarian paternalistic in that sense. Okay, so uh, what, what I'm trying to argue, though it might be wrong, but what I'm trying to argue is that active choosing is a form of libertarian paternalism. 
So I'm, I'm denying the suggestion that there's an opposition here. So that we ought not to think that libertarian paternalism means narrowly steering people that are in the direction of a particular outcome. It means steering people in a way that the choice architect thinks is in their interests. And that can be true of those choice architects who love active choosing. So if you say to people, you know, in order to get a driver's license, you're going to have to make a decision on X, Y, or Z. That is a form of paternalism for those people who don't want to make that choice, who would prefer to think about something else or would prefer a default. So if there's any you know, thing here that's really not in the book, and I hope that's true because this is going to be a separate book, <laughs> uh, the, the, it's that, that active choosing is part of the family. It's not, uh, it's not different, certainly insofar as it's a form of choice architecture that interferes with the considered or non-considered choices of those who'd prefer not to choose. Now, simplified active choosing, exactly the same thing. Simplified active choosing, I, this is often really good, and the hope is that we're gonna see a lot of it in a lot of contexts. Uh, where if you're skeptical about choice architects, you won't like a default rule, but you might be okay with active choosing with opt-out in favor of defaults. And the reason it's good is not that it's not libertarian paternalism. It's that it reduces in some contexts the sum of decision costs and error costs. You're completely right that if we define libertarian paternalism to mean steering in a particular direction, like a GPS, then active choosing isn't that. But that's not a necessary definition of libertarian paternalism. And if the choice architect is thinking, I want people to choose, even when people are thinking, I don't want to choose, then it's completely a form of paternalism. Thank you. I think we have time for one more, and then Professor Sensing will stay around for a few minutes in the break if you don't get a chance. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Salsarabi. I'm a PhD student in health policy here. Um, I know you. Hi. <laughs> you touched on the idea that promoting active choosing impairs that second order learning, that learning about when to learn. Um, a lot of physicians might consider that in healthcare, because of the special context, the stakes being so high, um, sometimes we can't allow people to learn not to learn. And I think the question that we had from the anaesthetist touches on that. I wondered whether you felt that actually the healthcare context was a special case, or whether you feel it the issues and problems around sort of second order learning and active choice in other areas of public policy, read across directly. Great, so I defer to the specialists here, including you, but I, I do have a few thoughts. Um, I think it, it's not, it's, it's a special case in a category of special cases where I think we should call it the, something like the technical and unfamiliar. And so the idea that, is, suppose you have a patient who has a, scare involving cancer, and there are various options. The idea that that person be, should become a specialist on cancer treatments, when the person hates that, rather than wants that, that's not self-evident at all. So that's what makes it a, a special case. Uh, some people who are Mill fans, who kind of feel, feel Mill's arguments in their bones, think that it, the, the muscle that is developed by becoming a specialist in your own disease must be developed even if people don't want that. But the question is whether that's a form of cruelty for those people who think this is you know, massively stressful, I'm miserable enough without having to learn all about cancer, and who think once I learn all that stuff, I'm, I'm not gonna know what to do, help doctor. And there's actually empirical evidence. There's a book from 1998 uh, by Carl Schneider, which has a bunch of patients, the majority, have the reaction I just described. They are not as excited about making choices as we might think under conditions of distress and unfamiliarity. So it is a special case. Now, the, the, the competing view, the Mill view, is that it's a part of freedom for someone under this rare but unbelievably significant moment of their life to master their situation 
and for a doctor to nudge or even to require that is, is in their interests. But there's a question whether that isn't uh, 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 kind of fussy or something to force that on them. Great, well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Apologies to those left on the queue. A big round of applause, Professor Thank you. Thank you.